bringing together voices in child and youth healthcare. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, and the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. And hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centres. And to today's webinar is, is entitled uh, Translating Emergency Knowledge for Kids, Bridging the Research to Practice Gap. And we've got some great presenters today with Dr. Uh, Terry Klassen and Dr. Shannon Scott. But before we get to that, I want to make sure everyone is familiar with our webinar process. Uh, the webinar will be approximately 60 minutes long and we do record the entire webinar and occasionally if we have a particularly live discussion it may go beyond that 60 minutes so we do have uh, uh, an hour an hour and a half scheduled for it but we try to fit everything into that 60 minutes uh, if you do uh, miss any part of it you can feel uh, you can we as I said we do record it and we post it on the knowledge exchange network the CAPC knowledge exchange network and you can go back and catch up on any pieces uh, that you might have missed in case you have to leave early and miss the uh, the question and answer period at the end of the session, for example. Um, as I mentioned, the record uh, we do record it and post it on the Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.cafc.org. Uh, and uh, you can that usually takes us two or three days to get that uh, information up onto the site. You can see the page in front of you there, which is where it will, uh, it will all this information will end up, including the recording. We will post presentations if they are made available. Um, often we do have researchers who do present tables of uh, what might be unpublished data that they're not able to share at this time. And, and we may post information now. We may post information in the coming uh, weeks or days or months or some of it we may not be able to post at all. So uh, so you can always pay attention to that that page on the Knowledge Exchange Network and, uh, and if, if for any of the information that you might want following this webinar. Uh, we do take questions, and for that, we to do that, we ask you to type your questions into the box that is in the control panel, usually appearing on the right-hand side of your screen. I always suggest that you type your questions in as you think of them. Don't feel you need to wait until the end when we call for questions. Feel free to type them in at any time. We sometimes have opportunities within the presentation or between presenters to, to answer a few of the questions. So, as I said, type them in as, as you think of the questions. Um, so with that out of the way, it's now my pleasure to not only introduce two of our speakers for today, but to also introduce you to Trek, which is uh, the which is a knowledge mobilization initiative funded by the uh, Government of Canada's National Centers of Excellence uh, pro uh, project and uh, or program. And Dr. Klassen will be telling us a lot more about what Trek is, what Trek is all about. Um, it's a great opportunity to bring some really excellent work from across the country uh, through these these knowledge, the, the program for the uh, networks of centers of excellence. We have a partnership with a number of networks of centers of excellence, including uh, many of you might be familiar with NeuroDevNet, the Brain Development Center of Excellence, and the uh, Children and Youth in Challenging Contexts uh, Center of Excellence. And we're going to be having some more webinars with them in the future. So keep your uh, eyes open for those coming up in in the coming months. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the CEO and Scientific Director uh, for the Manitoba Institute of Child uh, Health, uh, Dr. Terry Klassen, and he's also a, an Associate uh, Dean at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Manitoba, and the Ad Academic Director at the George and Fei Yi Center for Health and Healthcare Innovation, and I'm sure many from the CAFC audience uh, know who t uh, Terry Klassen is. He's certainly no stranger to uh, CAFC, to the CAFC conference. He's pre presented many times and has participated in much of our work over the last number of years. Uh, it's also my pleasure to uh, um, introduce Dr. Shannon Scott, who's the Canada Research Chair for Knowledge Translation in Child Health and is an uh, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. Uh, so without uh, any further ado, it's uh, my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to you, Dr. Uh, Terry Klassen. Okay, thank you uh, very much for that um, kind introduction and uh, certainly um, you know, the reason uh, Trek exists is because of a great partnership uh, with CAFC. So, um, as you, the Trek stands for Translating Emergency Knowledge for Kids, and uh, what we're going to do in the next uh, 50 minutes is I'm going to sort of give an overview of Trek um, for the first part, and then um, Dr. Shannon Scott will uh, have some very uh, new and, and fascinating results 
on a, a pan-Canadian needs assessment of what uh, people said uh, they need for uh, you know uh, delivering care in the emergency department. The trek, of course, this only happens because of a, a wonderful team, and um, it's my pleasure to work with uh, my four co-directors. Dr. David Johnson um, leads the knowledge translation part from the University of Calgary. Dr. Mona Jabur from CHEO and University of Ottawa has been uh, in charge of clinical pathways. Dr. Lisa Hartling, who's a colleague of Dr. Scott at the University of Alberta, is uh, leading the knowledge synthesis part. And you'll hear a lot more from uh, Dr. Shannon Scott in the knowledge needs assessment. So uh, TREC was really born out of this uh, earlier entity, which we called the Pediatric Emergency Research of Canada, or PERT, which really uh, started to get some uh, momentum and was established in 1995 and really was aimed at improving the quality of research and ultimately the care of kids in emergency. And PERC, you know, you look at the academic metrics, it had been, you know, successful in terms of publications and, and some of that resulted in um, actual work that started to uh, impact on patients. One example of that is the work on croup and as a series of uh, randomized trials and systematic reviews, you know, resulted in the CRUP guidelines, um, which, uh, which were produced initially in Alberta, that's where I was at the time, uh, along with Dr. David Johnson, and, you know, very clear um, guidelines that for uh, mild to moderate CRUP, you use uh, oral dexamethasone, you know, if the child was more severe, then you consider allopinephrine and the dexamethasone and, and hospitalize, hospitalize if, if the distress and very clear and, and really strong evidence that using this evidence-based approach would impact children and uh, could keep them out of hospital. But the real tragedy, I mean, part of the, the thing with this is that if we had been going after knowledge in a systematic way and synthesizing it, we could have, um, you know, 30 years earlier, we really known this, this cumulative meta-analysis shows that when that... Uh, that bar with the um, with the line in the middle, uh, once it crosses one to the right side, um, it shows that we know that steroids are better than placebo. And this could have been known back in 1966 if we had been doing knowledge synthesis and putting the evidence together. But it was only when uh, Carey's meta-analysis in 1989 actually was produced, um, it showed that for children hospitalized with croup, this could, um, you know, steroids would result in a shorter hospitalization, reduced probability of um, intubation. So this just showed, you know, we can't be, we have to be um, more systematic. We have to be on top of this because that's a 30-year gap in which kids um, missed out on an effective treatment. And, you know, how many kids were hospitalized or suffered uh, the ill effects of proof? So that was, you know, certainly the thinking behind TREC. And, and, you know, this then even uh, came out of the perk was uh, Candice Bjornsson from Calgary. You know, just a single dose, even for mild croup, could keep kids out of hospital and um, was really pivotal evidence in, in the whole thing. And then, of course, we uh, took this evidence even further and started to say, well, um, you know, we have, we now know the effectiveness, we have clinical improvement, reduced probability of hospitalization. With that uh, New England Journal article, we also looked at the cost effectiveness, shown that using steroids costs less per patient. Um, and then we started to say, well, we have to start embed this in a, in a more user-friendly way. And on the right side, you see the creation of storybooks where we're embedding the evidence in narrative in terms of trying to understand it from you know, a parent who experiences croup. Um, not in the emotional context, but what is evidence in context of uh, the patient and family's life. And, um, you know, we've done a randomized trial showing some effect of that intervention. And now Trek is actually taking that and trying to uh, put these uh, storybooks in a digital context saying, you know, maybe that's the next step in evolution. So um, you can see that now the, within that, you know, great evolution of evidence, this slide is kind of a you know, wake-up slide. It shows, uh, this came out of um, uh, evidence that we've done in, in Alberta showing that hospitals that are low volume, I mean that's hospitals who do not see a lot of cases of croup, they don't tend to use the evidence base, it's 22%, as compared to the high volume, these are hospitals that see a lot of cases of croup, much higher use of the evidence base intervention, 62%. 
And then we can move to the far right of the screen and you can see that the low volume hospitals, much higher probability of being admitted because they're not getting the evidence-based intervention and the high volumes, the opposite exists. So this is, was very strong evidence that if you're seeing a lot of cases, you may be, you, in the, at least in the example of croup, you definitely are using more evidence-based interventions. So that, you know, really was um, behind track to knowledge mobilize to ensure that all hospitals could benefit from that. Parallel to this, um, also uh, within the international context, the, we brought together the five pediatric emergency research networks um, in 2009 under the umbrella of pediatric emergency research networks. And this then becomes a global context of the evidence being uh, produced, three million ED visits around the world. And so we suddenly have this great production of evidence, but where is the evidence going? And you can see that um, this is the coverage of PERN around the world. There are obviously pockets of the world that um, don't have established emergency departments and we've started to work with the uh, some South American groups to help them get established um, and uh, so we are reaching out trying to work with groups where maybe the field of emergency medicine is not as well established. And then of course the decision rules for head injury for a kid with a mild head injury um, we have Martin Osman on the right and Nate Cooperman on the left um, you know, within the PER network, we have the American rules for, for mild head injury and the Canadian version. And what the telling point of this is that um, for the U.S. rules, it was who does, who does not need a CT, whereas here in Canada, Dr. Osman and the CATCH rule asks who does need a CT. So it can see how evidence and context becomes very critical. And this was the first iteration of the CATCH rule in terms of which child, children um, would require us um, a CAT scan, whether you're looking for neurological intervention or for looking for something to be found in the CT. So you have this PERC and PERN, important role in uh, producing the evidence with clinical uh, care, but we know that in Canada, 85% of the pediatric emergency cases are actually managed in general EDs. So that to us was really the motivating, the call to action uh, that created TREK. Um, so the vision of TREC was to create the highest standard of care so that everyone, whether they chose to seek uh, in, in treatment in a pediatric or general ED, would, would have a benefit. And we created a, um, a structure and, um, and the various, you know, divided Canada into the different nodes. Um, you can see we have seven, 16 PERC sites, Pediatric Emergency Research of Canada sites, and in, in each node um, we have uh, TREC sites um, so that they're partnered with, with a TREC site and, um, and just to create knowledge more in the, in the local context so that we had that ability when we started to mobilize knowledge. And this is an example of the 36 TREC sites there in the uh, pinkish, uh, um, and you can't see, always see the uh, PERC sites in the light blue. Um, and this includes nine provinces and, and one territory. And we try to get a flavor of um, community sites, rural sites, urban EDs. Um, on average, they see about 10,000 child health visits a year, but some may see as few as 1,000. So then thinking back to the low volume hospitals, some see 39,000. So that would be a high volume uh, hospital. And on average, about 20% of our visits were pediatric and we talked about the partnership and it really is around facilitating communication and knowledge mobilization. And the strategy for the knowledge mobilization, and this is where um, you're going to hear more about the, um, the number one piece, is determining the needs of receptors. We did not go in this assuming we knew what people wanted and what they needed within their context. Now that is perceived knowledge needs and we are working with our prioritization committee to also try to understand unperceived knowledge needs, knowing that people may not always know what they need to know. I mean, mo most often they do. Um, and for that, we're using things like, um, you know, um, cases that have been closed for the uh, Canadian Medical Protection Association, or we have referral, we have from Alberta, we have a large data set of why kids are being referred from general EDs to pediatric EDs. And so that is what's layering in to add for the unperceived knowledge needs from our knowledge assessment. 
using the knowledge synthesis group, we're saying, well, what's out there? Where is the evidence? And how does that map to the knowledge needs? And then we're starting to work with the mobilization phase and uh, really trying to assist general ADs in the access, adaptation, implementation of this new knowledge. And of course, four is to make sure that TREC is not just a you know, four or seven year um, grant, that it becomes an entity that really is, is having and impacting the quality of care across Canada. So I think we can stop for questions, but we, this is also the transition uh, point uh, to move to Shannon's uh, presentation around the knowledge needs. All right. Uh, so there haven't uh, been any questions typed in yet, so that's uh, my chance to remind the audience to do please, uh, please do type your questions in you know, as you think of them, uh, and we'll hand the uh, presentation over to Dr. Scott. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, be here with you all this morning to share the results of our Pan-Canadian um, Needs Assessment. Um, this is very exciting stage for us in terms of, of this work to be at this uh, stage to be able to share these results. Um, before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge um, the Needs Assessment team that uh, worked with me day in and day out um, to make this project happen, Dr. Lisa Given um, from Charles Stewart University and Wagga Wagga, Australia. She's um, an information scientist. And Ms. Lauren Albrecht, who is the project coordinator. And I also want to acknowledge um, the very hard work of all of our TREC coordinators across the country um, that are situated in the PERC sites that Terry just um, explained to you, um, who helped us do uh, the data collection for this work. So as Terry mentioned, the purpose of the needs assessment was to understand the information needs and preferences for knowledge mobilization amongst our receptor communities. And what we mean by that um, are the healthcare professionals working in the general emergency room departments, as well as the healthcare consumers that, that bring their children um, to the general emergency room departments for care. I want to stress up front that this isn't a typical um, research study um, where we are um, testing a hypothesis. Um, rather, we, through the process of this work, we have um, engaged with our receptor communities. We've built relationships with our TREC sites to try and understand the information needs and preferences to drive the next phases of TREC. So we went out to the general emergency room departments and um, we talked with um, the healthcare professionals and consumers in these communities. So how did we do this? We actually have a two-prong approach and my presentation this morning is really going to concentrate on the first part, which is the survey. Um, so we did a large quantitative um, survey uh, where we did a broad scan of our TREC sites. We had our coordinators visit our TREC sites to collect data via iPads. And this mode of data collection was very purposeful. It was designed this way to start building relationships between people within our pediatric emergency room departments as well as with our TREC sites. And this building of relationships is critical for effective knowledge mobilization. Healthcare professionals and healthcare consumers were invited to participate. And we had two different surveys for each um, group. Uh, we completed the surveys in either French or English. And our data collection took place from May 15, 2012 till October 2013. We presented our preliminary um, results on three different occasions to our prioritization committee within TREC. And they're really responsible for determining um, the priorities for um, the next stages of TREC. So as we started to get some results back from the survey, we started to feed those back to our prioritization committee. What I'm sharing with you today is the final complete data set and the findings. In terms of our final numbers, um, we had over 1,400 surveys completed from healthcare professionals working in the general emergency room department and just under um, 800 healthcare consumer um, surveys. 
Here is our participation by province. If we're just looking at the healthcare uh, professionals, and I'm going to present that data first from our healthcare professionals, and then move on to talk about the findings from the healthcare consumers. Um, we do see quite a variance in terms of participation by province, but you can also see in this slide we have various numbers of um, sites per province. For instance, Ontario has trek, uh, 10 trek sites, whereas other smaller provinces such as Nova Scotia um, only have one um, trek site. I'm just going to move now to a polling question. Um, just to get feedback from everybody. So what professional group do you think we received the most participation from? So this is your chance as the audience to provide your feedback. So just go up and click on the screen and make your uh, selection uh, for this question and we'll, uh, we'll flip the, uh, the responses back and see what the audience thinks as far as what professional group do you think they received the most participation from? Physicians, healthcare managers, nurses or allied healthcare professionals. All right, we'll close that. And it looks like uh, the audience thinks that 64% thought nurses uh, uh, received the most participation from nurses, followed by healthcare managers at 16%, followed by allied healthcare professionals, and then followed by physicians with 8% saying that they, you received the most participation from them. Our audience is pretty much right on the mark. Um, so that's that's great to see. So our largest, uh, and it's not surprising given the percentage um, that nurses make in terms of healthcare teams. Um, so just under 70% uh, percent of our respondents were nurses, um, and just under 20% were physicians. 6.4% were allied healthcare professionals. In terms of the years in the professional role, um, this is a graph that looks at um, all of the healthcare professionals who completed the survey. The average number of years spent in their professional role was just under 14 years. And if we look at the gender breakdown, almost three quarters of our survey participants um, were female. And here is a graphic representation of the age of the healthcare professionals that completed the survey working in the general emergency room departments of our study. Um, so we have quite a young group of um, survey respondents. And here's the breakdown in terms of employment status. So the bulk of the participants um, are working in full-time roles. And in terms of the number of years that they worked in the TREC site, um, on average, um, healthcare professionals worked nine years um, in their respective TREC sites. So in terms of our next question to the audience, what does the audience think was the most frequently identified source of knowledge related to providing information on pediatric emergency care currently used by survey respondents? Is it professional development opportunities? talking with colleagues, printed resources, or visiting specific health or medical websites. Oh, a couple more jumping in here. All right, so we'll close that off and then we'll share that. So it looks like 67% said the most frequently identified source of knowledge was talking with colleagues, uh, followed by 19% saying that uh, visiting a specific health medical or health slash medical websites and then printed resources and professional development opportunities tied with 7%. That's great. So that very much mirrors what our respondents um, from our survey said. So I'm just going to share with you the results here. So this is the complete sample, irrespective of bro being broken down by a province, site, or discipline. Um, and then I will mention and describe to you any specific either disciplinary or um, geographic differences. So in terms of um, how people currently normally find information they need in order to work with children seeking care in the emergency room department, the most frequently identified source was talking to colleagues. Um, the next most frequently identified source of knowledge was visiting specific health websites, followed by professional development opportunities, and then using um, the internet and seeking printed resources. Um, an important disciplinary nuance is when we looked specifically by discipline, um, 
over 90% of physicians, their top reported approach for finding information about kids um, was in terms of visiting specific medical and health websites. So that, that's critical for us as we move forward in terms of TREC. We also asked healthcare professionals how they assess their abilities to locate, assess and use reliable clinical information or evidence to provide the best care to children in the emergency room department. And this is particularly important for us in TREC to ensure that the approaches we use for knowledge mobilization in the future um, phases of TREC fit with the current um, information sources as well as the skill sets that healthcare professionals currently have. So if we look across this, um, in terms of um, a top reported abilities to locate, assess and use different types of sources of knowledge, specific medical and health websites was the most highly rated um, information source. Also, sorry, I just wanted to draw some attention to the fact that if we look at something such as social media tools um, that ranks quite low, that would be critically important for us at Trek to understand then that we would have to provide a way to enhance healthcare professionals' use of their skills in terms of that. So um, it's really important for us to get a sense that, that people quite highly rank their ability to find um, assess and use um, information from websites. We asked healthcare professionals which electronic devices um, they use to look for, no, for new information at work um, and we asked about specific electronic devices. Um, in terms of this, over 90% of healthcare professionals um, use a desktop computer um, we were very surprised that over half of healthcare um, professionals working in general EDs used um, a smartphone also to look up information. Now when we drill down and look at some different geographical um, differences, it's worth noting that up in the Northwest Territories, 87.5% um, of our respondents reported using a smartphone to look up new information at work. Um, as well, um, out in the Maritimes, we had reports of over 70% um, using smartphones as well for locating new information. And this is really important for us as we move forward to ensure that if we are going to be offering information um, on the web, that it is going to be able to be searchable and located and we can get it through smartphones because there's such a high percentage of um, our participants using these devices. From a disciplinary standpoint, this is also very interesting. 71.4% um, of physicians noted using um, a smartphone at work to locate information, 100% um, of residents, um, and 87.5% of nurse practitioners also were using smartphones to locate new information at work. So going back to the audience, on average, how many hours per week did our survey respondents indicate spending on looking up or finding new information on providing care to children? Just under two hours a week, more than four hours a week, less than 30 minutes per week, or the final response is about one hour per week. All right, so we'll close that off and we'll share that. So the majority are saying just under two hours a week and another 30% are saying about an hour per week. Absolutely. So if we look just specifically on the amount of um, hours per week do they spend reading or finding information specific to caring for kids in the ED, which is represented by the blue line, our average was just under two hours per week. Now that may seem insignificant um, to the audience. However, if we begin to consider what this means in relation to the 2,575 healthcare professionals represented in our TREC sites, if we look over the span of a year, that equates to over 260,000 hours um, spent looking for information related to how to take care of kids in the emergency room department. So that is not an insignificant amount of time um, spent um, annually by this large group of healthcare professionals. The red line is actually how many hours per week do they spend time reading or finding information 
overall in general that is not uh, specific to taking care of children in the emergency room department. Um, and this slide represents the variance across the different disciplines. Um, we did have a few outliers here. You could see with um, some of our um, nursing assistants, um, there's only seven of them, but there were two of them that actually had very high reported um, number of hours working, um, spending, looking up information. Um, so we're, we're not quite sure if they're going back to school or what the case is, but um, they certainly had um, a high number of hours spent looking for, for information. Um, residents as well, not surprisingly, were um, spent a lot of time every week looking up um, new information. But if we look at the red lines, we see anywhere of a range from 1.4 to 3.78 or 4.29 hours per week looking up information related to caring for kids in the emergency room department. So then when we asked healthcare professionals what types of information do they need that they don't currently have in order to provide the best care to children in the emergency room department, this is what we started um, to learn, is that healthcare professionals want more information on protocols and treatments for common conditions, they want evidence-based clinical pathways and clinical practice guidelines, and they also want evidence-based information on new diagnoses and treatments. So this is the type of information that healthcare professionals want in order to fulfill perceived knowledge needs. And this is um, just relating back to what Terry said earlier um, at the start of the presentation. So the survey is really targeting what healthcare professionals think that they need. Um, some disciplinary nuances is that 81.9% um, of physicians reported wanting um, evidence-based clinical pathways and clinical practice guidelines, and 76% of physicians wanted protocols and treatments for common um, conditions. Then we also drill down specifically in terms of what clinical conditions do people want more information. So in our survey, we presented quite an extensive list of the top reported um, conditions or reasons for um, children coming to the emergency room department based upon prior research. As well, we also had some free text boxes for people to indicate specific clinical information um, needs. And here are the um, top reported conditions where in terms of clinical conditions where people wanted more knowledge. It was in terms of multi-system trauma at 48.6%, severe head injury, meningitis, congenital heart defect, the first presentation, sepsis, status elepticus, diabetic ketoacidosis, croup, asthma, and intersusception. So if we look in terms of disciplinary differences, we do see some differences. Um, in terms of our physician group, um, the top ranked um, information source was first presentation of congenital heart defect um, with 46.9% of physicians saying they wanted more information about that. Um, and the second was multi-system trauma followed up by severe head injury. If we look at our nurse practitioners, the top um, ranked clinical condition where they wanted more information was croup with 75% indicating they wanted uh, more information on croup followed up by fever at 62.5% and our allied healthcare professional group their top three ranked conditions were croup, asthma and bronchiolitis. Then we also wanted to understand how healthcare professionals would like to receive this new information um, and here were the top uh, reported ways they wanted to receive information. The first was PD opportunities or professional development opportunities with just over 80% of our respondents saying that was their um, most frequently um, reported way they wanted to receive information, followed up by printed summaries um, and then talking to colleagues. Um, we didn't see any difference across uh, this across the provinces or in terms of rural, um, urban, or more remote sites. Um, we did see very little disciplinary difference when we looked across the disciplines, um, with the exception that um, when we look specifically at our residents, 87.5% um, also indicated um, that they would like to have um, an app with this information on it. 
So going back to the audience, so in light of these findings, how do they think Trek should aim to meet the information needs of healthcare professionals working in general emergency room departments in terms of providing health care to kids? So what should we do um, now that we know the information needs and preferences? So how should we attempt to meet those information needs? Should we be sending out email updates, holding an annual scientific meeting? Should we be creating a customized online repository of the best available knowledge on pediatric emergency care? And this question is a little bit different in that this is a, you can select all that apply here. Um, so you can, uh, you can choose more than one if you think it, uh, it would be good. And also we hope that this question can spur some um, discussion at the, at the end of the presentation in terms of next steps. All right, so we'll turn that around. And it looks like by far most people want, 93% of the people want a customized online repository of best knowledge. Uh, email updates uh, is quite popular, 46% saying that. And then an annual scientific meeting getting 21% of the votes. That's great to hear. So hopefully at the end we can have a further discussion on that point and maybe there are some other ideas of, of ways that we can start to um, meet the information needs. I'm going to quickly shift gears and just show you a glimpse into the healthcare consumer um, data. I'm um, here at this first slide, just a representation of where the consumers that participated in the survey, um, where, where what part of the province, what part of the country um, they came from. So we had very large participation from British Columbia, as well as from Ontario, um, Quebec, Alberta. Um, and we did have some response um, out in um, the Maritimes. The bulk of our um, healthcare consumer participants um, were female. And in terms of the age range of our parents, we see a nice breakdown here, with the peak being between 35 to 39. The highest level of education, and this is critically important for us as um, a network as we move ahead and we start to develop information and knowledge tools for parents. We want to be sure that these tools um, are appropriate for the audience. So in terms of the highest level of education reported, um, the most frequently reported category was college um, or non-university certificate or diploma followed up with the highest level of education being a high school diploma equivalent sitting in at 22.8 percent. In terms of this is the age of the child that um, the healthcare consumer brought into the emergency room department. In terms of our group of uh, parents, the 897 that completed the survey, the mean age of the child uh, was just over six and a half years of age. We also wanted to get a sense of, of how close the TREC site where the healthcare consumer um, completed the survey was to where the child lives most of the time. Um, we wanted to get a sense of our parents uh, that come to these TREC sites, do they spend a lot of time driving, what's the distance like. Um, so 15, just over 15% of the uh, survey respondents, um, they lived outside of the town um, or city where the emergency room was. Uh, department is located um, and you can see here the bulk of the respondents they lived in the same town or city or the same neighborhood. We also wanted to get a sense of, of in terms of the children that were coming um, to the emergency room department and the parents that were completing the survey um, how frequently the child gets regular or routine health checkups and that's defined as um, seeing a healthcare professional at least annually um, so 21% of the children um, did not have regular checkups. What was the reason that they brought their child into the emergency room department today? And these are the top ranks responses um, and people could indicate more than one reason for coming to the emergency room department. Not surprisingly, the most frequently reported one was they thought their child needed emergency attention. Um, the second one was interesting to us is they are coming to the emergency room department because this is the closest location for medical attention, um, followed up by healthcare professional recommendation, have come here in the past, etc. 
We also wanted to get a sense of, um, did they bring their child to the emergency room department because of a known condition? Um, in other words, does a child have a pre-existing um, or a chronic condition? Um, and in this case, 6% of the respondents um, did. Then we asked healthcare consumers what was the medical reason for coming to the emergency room department um, today. So the top reported a reason for coming to the emergency room department today by the parents who completed in our sur who are completed our survey, um, fever was the most frequently reported um, condition, followed up by vomiting, 10% stomach pain. Um, other includes responses that were less than 2%, reported by less than 2% of survey respondents. They were items such as fainting, um, a rash or itching, and mental health reasons. We also asked parents how they normally find health information um, in order to care for their child. And the top reported way that parents find health information is talking to trusted professionals, 68.7%, um, using internet search engines at 52.5%, and just over 50% um, talk to family and friends. So going back to the audience, I believe this is the last question. So what percentage of our survey respondents do you think looked for health information before bringing their child to the emergency room department for care? About 10%, almost 20%, almost 30%, or about 40%? And it looks like, well, it's pretty even. Uh, about uh, 34, the most common answer is, is almost 30%, followed by 20 and 40 were, uh, were, were in second. And only 3% said 10% of parents looked for uh, health information before bringing their child to the ED. Great. So in terms of our survey participants, 39% looked for information becoming, before coming to the emergency room department. We were very surprised by that number in terms of the number of parents that were actually looking for information before they sought health care. And then we asked them, where did they go? So where, where did they look for this information? And the top reported source of information was going to the internet with 44% of parents reporting um, seeking their information there, or over the phone with the healthcare professional was the second rank source at 31.9%, and then in person from a healthcare professional at 29.9%. So that represents sort of um, a bird's eye view of our quantitative survey findings from healthcare professionals and healthcare consumers in our TREC emergency room departments. In addition to the survey, we've also done some very focused qualitative work um, where we have done some focus group data collection um, in seven of our sites. And the sites that we selected were based upon maximum variation. So we wanted to ensure that we had representation from remote rural and urban sites, as well as variation uh, based upon size um, in terms of the number of pediatric visits per month. In our focus groups, we've shared preliminary survey findings back with the survey group participants, sorry, the focus group participants, and asked for feedback. Um, our focus group questions centered around um, our key survey questions, such as how do they normally find information? Um, in order to work with children seeking care in the ED. And we would share back the survey findings and get people's response in terms of that to get a more detailed understanding and description. Um, we also sought reflections back from our focus group participants in terms of the top 10 clinical conditions. Um, we also wanted to understand how they wanted to receive new information about providing care to children in the ED. We also specifically asked healthcare professionals if they had any procedural skill needs rather than clinical information needs. For instance, focusing on things such as conscious sedation, do they want um, more simulation, etc. In total, we've done 12 focus groups and one individual interview um, that have involved 57 healthcare professionals in seven of our TREC sites. 
Um, we are currently knee deep in our qualitative um, analysis, so the data collection is all complete, and our thematic analysis is currently ongoing. We're about halfway through um, at this point in time. As well as doing um, focus group interviews, we also did some participant observation in the emergency wait room waiting rooms of the these seven track sites um, and we had 57 observations completed and we observed for information sources present in in these track EDs and observed the routine actions of people of various ages in the emergency room department at different time periods in terms of you know what activities were they engaged in are they looking for information by using books pamphlets are they using smartphones etc all in the name of trying to ensure that the way that we start to mobilize knowledge fits with existing preferences and skill sets. I just want to thank everybody um, for being present here today. And if, if there's any questions, and here's the, my contact information if they've got questions post-presentation. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. And we do have a number of questions here, so if we can make sure that uh, Dr. Klassen and, uh, is back on the line as well. Um, the first question came in way back at the very near the beginning, uh, uh, or is related to your presentation right near the beginning, Dr. Klassen, where uh, Arlene is just asking for clarification. She was wondering, are any pediatric-specific like peds only emergency departments part of the TREC group, or is the network just for general emergency departments? Right. So um, that's an excellent question. So, and you know the um, the, the perk sites are pedi only pediatric emergency departments, and that's where a lot of the research is being generated. That's where it seems like we're actually doing a survey. They seem to have a lot of the guidelines, and they do a lot locally. So it was not the focus of Trek. But we take those pediatric emergency departments and now we partner each one of them with two or three TREC sites. So the, the pediatric emergency becomes the, um, the kind of the uh, nidus or the center and that is where the coordinator is based and they travel out to see the TREC sites, uh, they establish that relationship, they're very much involved with the knowledge mobilization um, activities, um, they will be you know, we'll, we've looked to them for some of the evidence-based resources. Um, eventually, when we move to face-to-face uh, -face or some of the educational outreach, that will, you know, uh, originate from the pediatric emergency department. So, um, by and large, um, the pediatric emergency departments are associated uh, with the children's hospital and with the university. Now I know there's that's a changing landscape and um, uh, I think the Surrey uh, Memorial has you know created a pediatric emergency so Surrey actually interestingly is one of our, our, our Trek sites but it's it is it's a unique um, entity because it has you know from the when Trek originated it has more if there's developing more into a pediatric emergency department. I'm not aware of any other um, place uh, currently in Canada uh, like that. All right. Um, the next question that we had is from Christina, and she's asking, this is back during the first portion of your uh, section of the presentation, Dr. Scott, uh, where you were presenting the data on the, uh, um, on the responses to the survey by occupation. And she mm -hmm. was just asking how many of each occupational category were recruited and how does that compare to the actual sample of respondents? Yeah, great question. Thank you very much. So the approach we tried to take with the healthcare um, professional group, so it, it was unique in the sense that we wanted to hear from as many healthcare professionals working in these general emergency room departments as possible. In fact, we tried almost a census-like approach with the intent of making contact and inviting all, almost all of the healthcare consumers working in each um, respective um, emergency room department. So um, overall, um, our response rate was 57%. And in terms of the different disciplinary groups, I'm sorry, I don't quite have that information um, tabulated at this point in time because we've, we've just finished um, doing the analysis of that piece. 
All right. Um, this next question is referring to one of the poll questions. And I am not 100% sure which question she's referring to. She says, I wonder with this question, uh, and because it, it did come in right after one of the poll questions, I can't remember, but uh, she says, did you consider implementation of information to an electronic patient system? Um, uh, Rianne, if you... How do you want to get your, yeah, how do you want to get your knowledge or information, right? That, that poll question. So that's like decision, as I understand it, that would be a decision support where you, yeah. you make an order and the thing pops up. It's embedded in the electronic health record. Record. Mm -hmm. Right. Was that so? Was was that considered part of the uh, as an option or part of the strategy? Uh, your knowledge mobilization strategy is engaging with the electronic patient system or order sets process or anything like that. So, in terms of that piece, at this point in time. Um, no, because we're working with so many different um, emergency room departments across the country, which all have different information systems, etc. And we're trying to implement a national approach or a national strategy. I don't know, Terry, if you wanted to add any more to that. Right. Well, I mean, I think obviously... Um you know we're we're very open and it's all about adaptation uh, to the local context and and that so it wasn't and we're just now developing the knowledge mobilization strategy based on the knowledge needs assessment the unperceived needs and the information we've gained about these sites so I wouldn't rule it out in the future and certainly you know patient order um, forms have been part of the discussion I mean, part of it is, um, even though we're funded by the NC program, um, it's it is a limited envelope. So you know, um, you know, that's a very grand idea that that someday, you know, uh, with sufficient funding, would be wonderful to inter because that will be the future of healthcare at some point. Uh, I would just say it's probably not going to be part of the first phase. It is on our radar screen, um, but you know that's we'll have to figure that out uh, as time goes forward. All right. Um, the next question is: uh, uh, it, it would be she's suggesting it would be interesting to see how many of the parents uh, brought their children to an emergency department because a clinic was not available. Was that considered at all? Um, it was not one of the options and in terms, uh, not one of the options in the survey. So of course you're constrained in a survey um, w with the responses provided, um, but in some of the free text boxes um, where parents could, you know, type in more information, um, that that is possible that parents could provide that response there. But we certainly, at this point, we're not linking that back to clinic availability, etc. Mm -hmm. right. um, Rianne's asking if you could both elaborate further uh, on what current implementation strategies are for disseminating the knowledge and are there studies running on evaluation on its effect? Right. Um, well, I can take the first um, um, go at that. So, uh, Dr. David Johnson and Dr. Monachur have been uh, developing that strategy. And um, it certainly is attempting to address the top 10 areas that have been identified along, you know, layering out the unperceived knowledge needs. Um, we are, I guess the concept, and, we, and I think a future um, CAPSI webinar will get into more of this detail, so I could just whet your appetite today. But it's um, the concept of a knowledge pyramid. So at the tip of the pyramid, you have what a lot of... Um, healthcare providers want, just the bottom line. When I go to the patient, what do I need to do? But at, that pyramid allows you to explore. We know, you know, some say, well, no, but I want to know um, which practice guidelines or which systematic reviews that was based on, or I'm really keen and curious. I want to drill all the way down to the prime. And that knowledge pyramid allows that discovery. But if you're just the bottom line person, so we're creating, we have three prototypes of those um, knowledge pyramids and of course now is how do we present it and and um, you know online and you know downloadable to your phone and, and uh, printable on a, on a page and, and that sort of thing 
Um, and then, of course, you know, how does that tie in with an educational uh, intervention? Because we know that people also want that, right? They want that ability. So we're developing the educational strategy um, uh, around that piece in terms of uh, how best to, um, you know, allow that uh, contextualization, that um, using more than just putting it out there um, to make people aware, to help them understand, help them to put it in their local context. Now, was there a second part to that question? There was the piece about of evaluation. evaluation. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, one of the things with the NCE is they don't allow you to do what we call, in quotes, research. So we have to have been very careful. Um, and then, of course, and a lot of our evaluation will be on um, process measures. So, you know, have these things been used? What do people think about them? Obviously, in the ideal world with unlimited funding and the ability, you'd want to know what is the impact, what is actually the change in health outcome. Unfortunately, with TREC, I don't think we have the funding base or the um, resources or, you know, one thing that uh, both PER, Pediatric Emergency Research of Canada, and TREC realize is we need to eventually work on the data systems, um, but they're, they're very diverse. Um, the information, obviously, it's very hard to, even if you do identify the quality indicators, it's hard to routinely gather them. Like when we've done that sort of work, um, and we do have more, in, let's say Mona Jabour is leading a, you know, implementation project in Ontario with general emergencies. And in that case, they are drilling more down to the, the outcome measures. Um, so we know we need to push the field that way. I mean, we have these grandiose visions of where we need to go, and then we have what we can do within TREC. So evaluation will be not ideal or where I, you know, in the best scenario would like to see it. Um, but eventually someday I could see a dashboard. We know how kids are doing with crew. There's a hot spot there. You, you drill in with your evidence. So you know, that's probably a 10-year, 20-year uh, plan to get there. That, that's right. I just want to echo what Terry's saying and, and just add on. I, I think we're also doing some small-scale evaluation as we start to develop some knowledge translation tools for parents. Um, for instance, we're currently um, digitizing the group storybooks that Terry mentioned, um, and we've got in the works a plan to um, take the storybooks out on iPads and share them with parents and get um, their reactions in terms of um, how the storybooks, um, are they effective, are they usable on mobile devices, etc. So we're trying to build in small-scale evaluations to ensure that our knowledge tools um, are usable and they are fulfilling the information needs of our audiences. Next question is for Dr. Scott, and they're asking uh, if you could perhaps elaborate on why the team was surprised that healthcare professionals used smartphones as often as they as they indicated as an information source, and how do you plan on addressing this in in your future recommendations or implications? Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, I guess we were surprised because in many cases, if we drilled down into um, uh, smartphones. Many of these are personal devices that people are using at work. In some cases, they are provided by work. So we were surprised at the extent of smartphone use and how people are using these devices to look up information. And the critical piece that, that we're taking from that is to ensure then, if we've got such high use of smartphones, is that any information that's provided by TREC on the web, it needs to be viewable. Um, on these smartphone devices um, if there's such a high use of them occurring in, in the emergency room departments. Yeah, and I must echo that. That's exactly what we're doing. We have a, a brilliant um, informatics person we're working with, Greg Van de Mosler, and he is building the web-based uh, resource on the exact assumption that it has to be one of these, and I don't understand all the technological aspects, that can then you know, uh, be viewed in a smartphone, can be viewed on site, can go to your iPad. So it is being built with that in mind and, um, you know, based on, on the wonderful data that um, Shannon has brought uh, to to the team. And so, um, and, and that's, you know, where we're going with that piece. Right. 
Uh, I think that's the last uh, of the questions that have been typed in um, so far. So we'll give people a chance to, uh, if they have any last, uh, you know, burning questions that, that they want to uh, add to the discussion. But while we're waiting for that, I'll just I'll just ask one of my own. I, I was I found that interesting where you were you asked the question about uh, how you would assess your abilities to locate, assess, and use reliable clinical information and evidence, etc. Uh, and and how low social media ranked there. I mean, I'm not surprised. Uh, healthcare is not a lover of social media, but I wonder, it'd be interesting, do you have any plans to repeat that question? And I wonder if, if, if I mean, I think most people would assume that that's changing, younger uh, clinicians and healthcare practitioners coming in that are more comfortable with, with social media. But I, I wonder if that's actually happening or if that's something that people think might be happening. Do you, do you have any plans to address that or do you have any, any understanding of that question? Or? Well, the intent of that question, Doug, is was to ensure that any of the um, in terms of our implementation plan, that the approaches we would employ would fit with the skill sets of the peop of the healthcare professionals working in the trek sites. Um, of course, it would be interesting to replicate the needs assessment to see how these um, skills have changed in, over time. I agree with you um, that I believe that this is an evolving skill set that that we would see an increase over time. Um, what I take from the response is that okay, um, with a lim limited funding envelope, as Terry mentioned, we, we shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in the basket of social media because that we may not have the best success um, from that approach. Um, so certainly if we, if we wanted as an organization to use social media tools, we would have to be providing um, also some skills training or information in terms of how to um, enhance the skill set with this group at this point in time. But in terms of do, do we have plans to um, replicate this um, needs assessment at any point in time? Not formally, no, but we certainly acknowledge, um, like you do, that these skills would change and evolve over time and, and it's something to keep in mind as we move forward. Well, and I'd, I'd point out that Dr. Lisa Hartling, who's part of our, one of our co-directors, has done a um, systematic review on, on the use of social media in the health context. So, you know, what, just that's not just pediatric emergency, but what's out there in terms of the use and how has it been used in the context of health? So, um, she has an excellent um, evidence base, and I think that is a platform to say, well, hey, that's that usage, you know, maybe Twitter in this context has really looked good. Um, so that's excellent. And then we also have uh, Dr. Christy Whitmer, who's here as part of our knowledge translation pillar within um, the Center for Healthcare Innovation. One of her strong interests is this use of social media, and she's done with a pediatric surgeon some really interesting and innovative work in the area of Hirschsprung. So we have people in the TREC community who would allow us to, you know, explore or, or go into that. So um, right now we're just trying to, you know, get, um, build some of the really um, more straightforward stuff. But we have some of the evidence floating around. We have the people who have a passion around it. So uh, stay tuned. Who knows? Thanks. And we did have one more question came in. Um, uh, they're asking, how do uh, Dr. Klassen and Scott plan on disseminating these research findings and subsequent information from Trek to hospitals that were not represented on that map, at least as initially shown? Well, um, obviously we had a benefactor um, like Dr. Gates who would uh, put 50 million on the table. We'd go to every emergency tomorrow and build in, but you know, so Number four under my uh, was around sustainability and um, to broaden Trek. So I don't know the clear pathway there. My experience in life, and I've had some wonderful experiences, is you build something for the right reason, in the right way, with the right people. You don't know where that's going to end up. And, and my dream and goal, again, again, is would be that every child in every emergency in this country would have access or could you know have um, be available to the same resources so it is there I don't I don't have the funding today I, I hope that if we have some early wins and get momentum with the smaller uh, 36 Trek ED um, site that you know uh, momentum will build and 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 you know when you can show cost effectiveness and other things you know, I think that's when the health system um, starts to 
to um, want to be part of it or find ways to fund it even within their existing resources. So I can't pay today paint you that clear pathway. I would say if you go back to our vision, it still is about every child visiting an emergency department in this country, and I would say if you have a global bit around the world, deserves the same, you know, the highest level of care possible based on the evidence-based uh, approaches. So that's where we need to be eventually. Uh, we can't be there today, but again, you know, the long-term horizon, let's hope we can be someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just echo what, what Terry is saying. And um, in terms of the next phase for dissemination of the results that you've heard today, um, we have been presenting these results in many different venues, such as here today at CAFC. Um, we are also are going to be presenting the results at targeted um, emergency medicine conferences, pediatric and health services research conferences, and then starting um, with dissemination through publication as well. With that grand vision of every child in Canada and perhaps the world having access to the best information, I think maybe this is our opportunity to wrap this up. And maybe we'll just hand it over to Dr. Klassen and Dr. Scott for any final comments that you'd like to leave the audience with. Well, I just want to thank CAFC and I want to thank Doug for moderating and thank, uh, even though I feel a little disconnected to all the people out there, but I want to thank each and everyone who took your time to listen. Um, I mean, I think this is a wonderful, um, you know, program and, and it's early days, um, but I'm just thankful people are interested and I hope we've been able to convey that uh, to you. Yes, I would just echo that. Thank you very much for your participation today and for your feedback and questions. Um, it's very inspiring for us and gives us new ideas as, as we move forward with Trek. All right. Well, thank you both. It was a great presentation. I mean, lots of great questions from the audience. So thanks to everyone. As I think we heard Dr. Klassen mention, we do have another webinar with uh, the Trek group coming up. The details, specific title and description on that to, to be determined. But I believe April 2nd will be the date of that. So please, uh, please mark your calendars and uh, look for more information on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network or uh, through our uh, CAFC Presents email newsletter. Uh, and as I mentioned, the session was recorded, so you can always uh, go to the Knowledge Exchange Network at www.can.cafc.org to uh, take a look at that and any of the PowerPoint presentations that we are able to share with you. We will post those up as well. Um, we do these webinars usually Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, so hopefully we will uh, see you on one of our upcoming ones. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us here at CAFC. Thanks again for coming, and we'll talk, see you all soon at the next webinar. Bye.